Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Can you hear me? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Danwats Maharaj. Maharaj, do you want me to make you the co-host? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Hare Krishna, yes, Maharaj, we can hear you. At last. Okay. Uh, Maharaj, uh, do you want me to make you the co-host or do you want me to share the screen for you? Uh, I don't want to be the co-host. You can share the screen. Okay, Maharaj, I'll do that right now. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Maha Vanchakaupata Rudyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare. So we're studying the Sri Ishopanishad for the Bhakti Shastri. And to, this evening we're beginning mantra number 12. I will read the Sanskrit. Andantamaha Prabhishanti Ye Sambhuti Mupasate Tato Bhuya Ivate Tamo Yau Sambut Yam Rataha Translation Those who are engaged in the worship of demigods enter into the darkest region of nations. Ignorance. And still more so do the worshippers of the impersonal absolute. So uh, we heard about, in the previous section, we heard in verses 9, 10, and 11, the comparison between vidya and avidya, or between knowledge and nescience. Now in the next verses, uh, namely 12, 13, and 14, we will hear about the comparison between worship of the demigods and the worshippers of the impersonal absolute. Recording in progress. Srila Prabhupada's purport begins. The Sanskrit word sambuti refers to those who have no independent existence. Sambhuti is the absolute personality of Godhead who is absolutely independent of everything. In the Bhagavad Gita, the absolute personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, states, Namevidu Suragana Prabhasmi Sashi Shur oh, Prabhavam na Mahashayaha Aham Adi Aham Adirhi Devanam Mahashinam Chasarvashaha. Neither the hosts of demigods nor the great sages know my origin or opulences, for in every respect I am the source of the demigods and sages. Thus, Krishna is the origin of the powers delegated to demigods, great sages and mystics. Although they are endowed with great powers, these powers are limited, and thus it is very difficult for them to know how Krishna himself appears by his own internal potency in the form of a man. All right, so Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us the absolute position of the personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna. 
that even the powerful demigods and great sages don't fully understand or appreciate his position. And Lord, the Lord is the source of the power of the demigods. Whatever great powers they may have, it is these are powers given to them by the grace of the Supreme Lord. So it's very difficult for them. And not only them, of course, it's just difficult for them. It's even more difficult for us to understand the Lord by his own internal potency. The Lord has these inconceivable potencies. And certainly it's bewildering for all of us. But if we surrender to him, the Lord can reveal himself to us. This is the point. Srila Prabhupada continues, Many philosophers and great rishis or mystics try to distinguish the absolute from the relative by their tiny brain power. This can only help them reach the negative conception of the absolute without realizing any positive trace of the absolute. Definition of the absolute by negation is not complete. Such negative definitions lead one to create a concept of one's own. Thus one imagines that the absolute must be formless and without qualities. Such negative qualities are simply the reversals of relative material qualities and are therefore also relative. By conceiving of the absolute in this way, one can at the utmost reach the impersonal effulgence of God known as Brahman. But one cannot make further progress to Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us the limitations of the process of trying to understand the Lord by our tiny brain power, in other words, by speculation. Uh, Prabhupada talks about how we uh, are the impersonalists in trying to understand the Lord, they will simply, they, they want to negate everything. Uh, the negation, the, in other words, they say the Lord is not this, he's not that. The Lord, they say the Lord has no form, the Lord has no senses, the Lord cannot walk, he cannot talk. And this, they make many, they, uh, they declare many different negations in the aspect of the personality of Godhead. Or as defined here, the absolute. They, they define the absolute by negation. In other words, they say, it's not this, it's not this, it's not that. It has no form, it has no personality, it has, like this, they want to negate everything. So, if, if, if the problem with doing like this is that you, we imagine that the absolute truth is without form and without qualities. In other words, we, we think that if someone has a form and someone has qualities, that these must all be material. But we fail to understand that the absolute truth can have form and qualities which are not material, which are spiritual. So neg negating qualities is simply reversing everything. It's not giving us the full understanding of the absolute truth. We may agree that the Lord has no material form. He has no material qualities. But we can say he has a spiritual form and he has spiritual qualities. 
this is something, a concept which is not understood by the impersonalists and by the jnanis and the speculators. So, because of their process of trying to understand the Absolute, they can only know God as Brahman. They will know God as the impersonal Brahman, but they will not know him as Bhagavan. They will not know him as the personality of Godhead. So, this is the limitation of the process of negation. Srila Prabhupada continues, he says, such mental speculators do not know that the absolute personality of Godhead is Krishna, that the impersonal Brahman is the glaring effulgence of his transcendental body, or that the Paramatma, the super soul, is his all pervading plenary representation. Nor do they know that Krishna has his eternal form with his uh, with, with its transcendental qualities of eternal bliss and knowledge. The dependent demigods and great sages imperfectly consider him to be part to be a powerful demigod, and they consider the Brahman effulgence to be the absolute truth. But the devotees of Krishna, by dint of their surrendering unto him and their unalloyed devotion, can know that he is the absolute person and that everything emanates from him. Such devotees continuously render loving service unto Krishna, the fountainhead, of everything. So Srila Prabhupada is describing the, how, how the devotees can realize the full nature of the Absolute Truth. They can realize his transcendental form and his transcendental qualities. But those who are speculators who are depending on their own brain to try to understand the reach the conclusion of the Absolute, they will only know the Lord in, uh, up to the impersonal feature. They will not be able to realize the actual transcendental nature of the Lord. Prabhupada continues, in the Bhagavad Gita it is said that only unintelligent, bewildered persons, driven by a strong desire for sense gratification, worship the demigods for the temporary relief of ordinary, for the temporary relief of temporary problems. Since the living being is materially entangled, he has to be relieved from material bondage entirely to attain permanent relief on the spiritual plane, where eternal bliss, life, and knowledge exist. Sri Ishupanishad, therefore, instructs that we should not seek temporary relief of our difficulties by worshipping the dependent demigods, who can bestow only temporary benefits, whether we must worship them or oh, rather we must worship the absolute personality of Godhead Krishna, who is all attractive and who can bestow upon us complete freedom from material bondage by taking us back home, back to God. So, uh, as in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna derides the worship of demigods that people who worship the demigods are described as being less intelligent and the results of the worship is limited and temporary. So we don't solve any problem of our material existence 
by approaching the demigods and worshipping them and getting some benedictions from them. Because whatever benedictions we will secure from the, the demigods, it will be limited and temporary. So we should understand that the, the problems of life are not solved by temporary adjustments of the material nature. We have to ultimately surrender to the Supreme Absolute Truth. Srila Prabhupada continues, It is stated in the Bhagavad Gita 7.23 that the worshippers of the demigods can go to the planets of the demigods. The moon worshippers can go to the moon and the sun worshippers to the sun, etc. Modern scientists are now venturing to the moon with the help of rockets. But this is not really a new attempt. With their advanced consciousness, human beings are naturally inclined to travel in outer space and to reach other planets, either by spaceships, mystic powers, or demigod worship. In the Vedic scriptures, it is said that one can reach other planets by any one of these three ways. But the most common way is by worshipping the demigods presiding over a particular planet. In this way, one can reach the moon planet, the sun planet, and even Brahmaloka, the topmost planet in the universe. However, all planets in the material universe are temporary residencies for the only permanent place. The only per permanent planets are the Vaikuntha Lokas. These are found in the spiritual sky where the personality of Godhead himself predominates. As Lord Krishna of states in the Bhagavad Gita, Abrahma Bhuvanal Loka Punara Vartano Arjuna Mamu Paitya Tukuntiya Punar Janman Navidyate. From the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest, all are places of misery wherein repeated birth and death take place. But one who attains my abode, O son of Kunti, never takes birth again. So Srila Prabhupada was describing to us three different ways by which people have been traveling to different places in the universe. He says, uh, he says sometimes people travel by mystic powers and sometimes people travel by uh, spaceships, just like <laughs> in Srila Prabhupada's time there was the expedition to the moon. So travel in outer space, Prabhupada said, is not a new thing. You can go by spaceships, you can go by mystic power, but the most common method is by demigod worship. And Prabhupada says that uh, in the Vedic scriptures, it describes how by worshipping demigods, you can go to the planet, the different planets of the demigods. Somebody worships the sun god, they will go to the sun planet, one of the higher planets. Somebody is a devotee of Lord Brahma, they will go all the way up to the topmost planet in the universe, Satya Loka. So the problem is, as Srila Prabhupada describes, that these planets are not eternal. You can go there, but these planets are not eternal. You cannot stay there forever. They're subject to annihilation. Just as there is creation, there is also annihilation. And after annihilation, then there's creation again. So we want to understand how to make proper use of the human body. 
It's not meant for just simply traveling in the material world, but we want to travel out of this material world. Prabhupada's purport continues, Sri Shopanishad points out that one who worships the demigods and attains to their material planets still remains in the darkest regions of the universe. The whole universe is covered by the gigantic material elements. It is just like a coconut covered by a shell and half filled with water. Since its covering is airtight, the darkness within is dense, and therefore the sun and the moon are required for illumination. Outside the universe, in the vast and unlimited Brahma Jyoti expansion, which is filled with Vaikuntha Lokas, the biggest and highest planet in the Brahma Jyoti is Krishna Loka or Goloka Vrindavan, where the Supreme Personality of Godhead Sri Krishna himself resides. Lord Sri Krishna never leaves Krishna Loka. Although he dwells there with his eternal associates, associates. He is omnipresent throughout the complete material and spiritual cosmic manifestations. This fact has already been explained in Mantra 4. The Lord is present everywhere, just like the sun, yet he is situated in one place, just as the sun is situated in its own undeviating orbit. So Srila Prabhupada is elaborating on the fact that in the spiritual sky there are the Vaikuntha planets and the Vaikuntha planets are all eternal. They're not subject to creation or destruction. They're eternally existing. And the inhabitants there are many devotees who reside there on the Vaikuntha planets and they enjoy the association of the Supreme Lord who expands himself into each of these different planets in the spiritual sky. Then Srila Prabhupada discusses how the Lord is, uh, has also an abode above the Vaikuntas. There's the topmost planet in the spiritual sky Goloka Vrindavan, or uh, it is also known as Krishna Loka. So Lord Krishna's residence is there, and he's always there. And at the same time, he's present everywhere because he's present by his expansion, by his energies. He's expanded in the different Vaikuntha planets, and he expands also in the material creation. Srila Prabhupada continues, the problems of life cannot be solved simply by going to the moon planet or to some other planet above or below it. Therefore, Sri Ishopanishad advises us not to bother with any destination within this dark material universe, but to try to get out of it and reach the effulgent kingdom of God. There are many pseudo-worshippers who become religionists only for the sake of name and fame. Such pseudo-religionists do not wish to get out of this universe and reach the spiritual sky. They only want to maintain the status 
They only want to maintain the status quo in the material world under the garb of worshipping the Lord. The atheists and impersonalists lead such foolish pseudo-religionists into the darkest regions by preaching the cult of atheism. The atheist directly denies the existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and the impersonalists support the atheists by stressing the impersonal aspect of the Supreme Lord. Thus far, we have not come across any mantra in Sri Ishupanishad in which the Supreme Personality of Godhead is denied. It is said that he can run faster than anyone. Those who are running after other planets are certainly persons. And if the Lord can run faster than all of them, how can he be impersonal? The impersonal concept of the Supreme Lord is another form of ignorance arising from an imperfect conception of the absolute truth. So this uh, presentation of the personal feature of the Lord is an important part of the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, and Srila Prabhupada's mission was to present the teachings of Lord Chaitanya to defeat the impersonalism and voidism. So here Srila Prabhupada is taking up the uh, point that some, that some class of people, they will argue that the Lord has no form, that if he had a form, it must be material. Uh, Prabhupada describes that there, there are people also who are atheists. They, they just simply want to enjoy the material world. And at the same time, they, will, they may pose themselves as being religious. And they attract followers and they will lead people into the path of atheism. They will deny the personal features of the Lord. They may say that ultimately we're all God. So if we're all God, then there's no meaning to God anymore. If everyone is God, then there's no meaning to God anymore. In other words, impersonalism is an atheistic philosophy because they deny the personal features of the Lord. And if we deny the personality of the Lord, then we we're arguing that the Lord is impersonal. And if he's impersonal, then every one of us can become also the one with the God, one with the Lord. In other words, it's all atheistic philosophy. But Prabhupada quotes earlier mantras, how anijadetam maniso jabiyo, that the Supreme Lord uh, can overcome all, the, all others running. He's more swifter than the mind. So, how could the Lord be impersonal if he is able to do these kind of things? So, these arguments of the impersonalists, they, they're easily defeated by the devotees. And when we present personal philosophy to them, then they cannot defeat. They have no argument. So impersonalists can also be brought to Krishna consciousness by presentation of the Krishna conscious philosophy. Impersonalists can be changed to personalists. 
but it, it takes mercy. It's not an easy job. The longer a person has been involved with impersonalism, then the more difficult it is for them to give it up. So we encourage the people, take prasadam and chant Hare Krishna. These two things are very powerful in helping to change the heart of the impersonalists and the atheists. There are many atheistic philosophies which go in the name of religion. And just you say, oh, there, there's no God. That's another atheistic philosophy. Anatma. People talk about anatma, no soul. It's another atheistic philosophy. Anything which is against the Vedic literature, then that is an atheistic philosophy. Srila Prabhupada continues, the ignorant pseudo-religionists and the manufacturer, manufacturers of so-called incarnations who directly vi violate the Vedic injunctions are liable to enter into the darkest region of the universe because they mislead those who follow them. These impersonalists generally pose themselves as incarnations of God to foolish people, to foolish persons who have no knowledge of Vedic wisdom. If such foolish men have any knowledge at all, it is more dangerous in their hands than ignorance itself. Such impersonalists do not even worship the demigod according to the scriptural recommendations. In the scriptures, there are recommendations for worshipping demigods under certain circumstances. But at the same time, these scriptures state that there is normally no need for this. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly stated that the results derived from worshipping the demigods are not permanent, since the entire material universe is impermanent. Whatever is achieved within the darkness of material existence is also impermanent. The question is how to obtain real and permanent life. So Srila Prabhupada is analyzing these uh, different deviant philosophies. How you, you get a class of people who uh, manufacture so-called incarnations. So if someone is actually an incarnation of God, then it has to be established by the help of scriptures. All of the Lord's incarnations are described in the scriptures. So there has to be scriptural evidence to support someone's claim to being an incarnation. But foolish people, by their power and by their magical uh, abilities, somehow they're able to attract the mind of the less intelligent people. And the less intelligent people may accept them as an incarnation of God. Now, there's also a class of people who are worshipping the demigods. And they're worshipping the demigods for material benefits. Again, Antavattu palam tesham tad bhavati alpamedasham. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna clearly mentions the defect in worshipping demigods. If we worship gods other than the Supreme Lord, the result will be that we get things which are limited and temporary. So devotee points out to the worshippers of the demigods the limitations of this path of worship. And we point out that the actual process is we should worship the Supreme Lord. 
we shouldn't just be interested to get material benefit, which is limited and temporary. Mm. Oh, Krishna. All right, so Prabhupada condemns those people who will worship uh, ordinary people and who will make them into incarnations of God. And Prabhupada explains their destiny is that they all enter into the darkest region of ignorance. The incarnations, the so-called incarnations of God, go into the darkest regions of ignorance. And the others who follow them, they will also go. So then Prabhupada then takes up the point then, how to obtain real and permanent light. This is the final part of this purport, quite a long purport. The Lord states that as soon as one reaches him by devotional service, which is the one and only way to approach the personality of Godhead, one attains complete freedom from the bondage of birth and death. In other words, the path of salvation from the material clutches fully depends on the principles of knowledge and detachment gained from serving the Lord. The pseudo-religionists have neither knowledge nor detachment from materialistic, from material affairs. For most of them want to live in the golden shackles of material bondage under the shadow of philanthropic activities disguised as religious principles. By a false display of religious sentiments, they present a show of devotional service while indulging in all sorts of material activities. In this way, they pass as spiritual masters and devotees of God. Such violators of religious principles have no respect for the authoritative acharyas, the holy teachers in the strict discipline succession. They ignore the Vedic injunctions, Acharya Pasana, one must worship the Acharya. And Krishna's statement in the Bhagavad Gita, Evam Parampara Praptam, this supreme science of God is received through the disciplic succession. Instead, to mislead the people in general, they pose themselves, become so-called acharyas, but they do not even follow the principles of the acharyas. So Srila Prabhupada is describing to us the path of coming to approach the Supreme Personality of Godhead we want to approach, we want to get real and permanent life, we have to approach the Lord. And we have to approach the Lord by devotion. We have to cultivate knowledge, transcendental knowledge, and detachment from the material world. It is, of course, it's stated that by application of devotional service, 
a person automatically acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. So if we are performing our devotional service regularly in the proper manner, then it's expected that we will be cultivating both jnana and vairagya, both knowledge, transcendental knowledge, and detachment from the world. These two things naturally develop for every devotee who takes shelter of the process of devotional service, strictly following the principles, the regulated principles. He must develop knowledge and detachment. And with the help of knowledge and detachment, he can develop his devotion for the Supreme Lord Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada condemns these other people, the pseudo-religionists, who have neither knowledge nor detachment. They want to live uh, in the shackles of material bondage, under the shadow of philanthropic activities disguised as religious principles. So philanthropic activities, in other words, say, do welfare activities and make arrangements to help different unfortunate sectors of the society. And people think that this is, a, this is they think this is real religion. But Prabhupada describes, he said, this is actually false sentiments. To just simply do philanthropic activities, in other words, feeding the poor, and distributing uh, clothes to help the needy, or it may be uh, running an old people's home or a children's home, different things like this. This can all be philanthropic activities. We want to understand that the real path of devotion is taught to us by the Acharyas, and they teach us the importance of service to the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada quotes a Vedic injunction, Acharya Pasana. We have to worship the Acharya, the worship of the spiritual master. And then Prabhupada also refers Bhagavad Gita, Evam Parampara Praptam. This knowledge is received through, through the line of the cyclic succession. So we have to understand everything in the proper manner with the help of the uh, the great spiritual acharyas. And Srila Prabhupada, therefore, in his comments, he always quotes the acharyas and helps us to understand their message. So there's just one paragraph remaining here of this purport. These roles are the most dangerous elements in human society because there is no religious government. They escape punishment by the law of the state. They cannot, however, escape the law of the Supreme who has clearly declared in the Bhagavad Gita that envious demons in the garb of religious propagandists shall be thrown into the darkest regions of hell. Sri Ishopanishad confirms that these pseudo-religionists are heading towards the most obnoxious place in the universe after the completion of their spiritual master business which they conduct simply for sense gratification. So, of course, this is a great offense to do things like that. Prabhupada says the most dangerous elements in human society. And because they're presenting this a lot this they're presenting this uh their message in the way of philosophy and so they're misleading the people 
the common people are being bewildered. They're being led away from the actual truth and they're becoming atheistic. So this is a great sin on their part. So Srila Prabhupada, you can see, he's written very strongly about it. The most dangerous, the most dangerous elements in human society. So, uh, the Ishopanishad confirms that these people enter into the darkest regions because they're engaging in so-called spiritual activities simply for sense gratification they don't follow any rules and regulations and they don't present the real message of the shastra so they're offenders to the supreme lord so this is a very important uh, instruction here are there any questions anybody Hare Krishna, Maharaj, can I ask you a question? Please, yes. Thank you. Uh, Haribol Maharaj, uh, uh, when, when you mentioned, when Sila Prabhupada mentioned the word philanthropic activities, uh, and you also gave some examples of it, I, I would like to know a little bit deeper on, on the meaning of this, because... Um, uh, of course, like the principle of worship the Lord, of worship Krishna, uh, is the, the fundamental principle. But also, what's about you know, uh, you know, uh, activities which are also it sounds like under the category of philanthropic ac activity, but it's also you know look, to look after you know the old elderly people, the sick people. Uh, the poor people, uh, you know, charity or being generous, help each other, um, which is also, how to say, is, is also activities that shows a good heart, you know, uh, means for the devotees also, you know, means uh, uh, among devotees or, or helping other people who are suffering, uh, always keeping in mind of Lord Krishna in the center, of course. Uh, uh, that will be correct, Maharaj. Well, uh, Prabh Prabhupada points out that these people who are doing these things, he talks, we'll just see what he says here in the second. He said, uh, for most of them, the pseudo-religionists have neither knowledge nor, nor detachment for material affairs. For most of them want to live in the golden shackles of material bondage under the shadow of philanthropic activities disguised as religious principles. So, yes, uh, you know, we... As devotees, the Krishna Consciousness Movement, we're often invited to take part in different philanthropic activities. For example, maybe there's an earthquake somewhere in India. One, I remember some years ago, there was an earthquake in Bhuj, in Gujarat. And so the devotees went there and they distributed food and they give blankets also. So it appears like philanthropic activities, but because everything is being done in the service of the Lord, so it's not just simply ordinary, mundane philanthropic activities. The devotees, they will distribute food, they will distribute prasada. They're going to make they're going to cook food and offer it to the Lord. They're not just simply going to feed people, but they're going to give people prasada. And similarly, when it comes to uh, helping people, like we have hospitals, you know, we, we do have hospitals, and, uh, and sometimes you have eye camps and these things. 
So these are of great help to the common people. And it's an opportunity for us to give some Krishna consciousness to these people. People suffering from some physical health problems or eye problems, like cataract problems. They have the eye camp and the doctors come and they will remove the cataract. And in this way, people are able to restore their vision. So yes, it appears to be a philanthropic activity, but because everything is being done by devotees, it's being done, it's, it's not being done simply in the, in, as, a, as a religious principle. Certainly, uh, devotees don't have that misunderstanding. But we do it, we perform these activities to encourage people to take up genuine religious principles. That's how I understand it. Just like, you know, we have, doctor, we have devotee doctors who come and they will give their time and they, they will help to treat people. And by their help, by their service, they're able to... Uh, create a good impression in the minds of the common people and the common people will consider more seriously the path of devotion just like we will encourage people who come to the hospital that they will hear the holy name they will hear the chanting of the maha mantra and they will be given spiritual food like prasadam they'll be seeing the devotees regularly. So in this way, they'll be given some uh, seed of devotion. The, the seed of devotion can be planted in people. And then in that way, they can be guided to take up the real work of devotional service, hearing and chanting. But it's not that just simply serving the poor is in itself that's that's not the religious principle. You know, they, they have a, even a saying, they say, Man, Manava Seva Madhava Seva. They say, by serving the people, you're serving God. Well, that's not exactly true. We, it's a question of how you serve the people. And we have to bring them, we have to serve them in the way that we can give them Krishna consciousness help them to Im increase their understanding of who is the Supreme Lord and how we can serve the Lord. Thank so you, the, <laughs> the danger is people think that, oh, just simply giving food to people or feeding the poor or doing philanthropic activity. They are thinking that is the religious work. But, of course, that is not actually the religious work. The religious work is where we actually give them the holy name and where we give them Krishna Prasadam and where we give them some Krishna consciousness. That is the real religious work. Awakening them to Krishna consciousness. Yes. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much for the wonderful explanation, Maharaj. Well, I, I hope it's all right. Are there any other question? Anyone? So, Maharaj, I have a few questions. Uh, my oh. first question is that aren't devatas and the great rishis, aren't they supposed to be um, great devotees of the Lord? And how to understand that these personalities, they, they don't understand that the Lord is the Supreme Lord, whether they see him is only as a greater than God. How can we understand that? Well, we see that uh, the demigods, for example, they have some attachment. They are situated in the mode of goodness. But they're not in the mode of pure goodness. They're situated in the mode of goodness. And 
they do have some attachment and we see sometimes how they become envious of some other person just like when Maharaj Prithu was performing sacrifice then Indra became jealous of him and stole away the horse like this uh, demigods are very pious living entities. They've performed a lot of pious activities, but at the same time, they have their at attachment to enjoying the material facilities. So this is the obstruction to them knowing the Supreme Lord, that while they're very exalted souls and they're given they're given a big position in the universe, but they they want that position. They actually want, they have that desire to enjoy the material world still. So this is why they don't know the Supreme Lord. And it's pointed out because the Lord comes before them. They come from the Lord. Just like li little children what can they understand about the mother and father? They can never understand the mother and father. The children. So in the same way, the demigods, they come from the Supreme Lord. They cannot understand the Lord. But if the Lord wants to reveal himself to them, he can. All right? Marsh, uh, these these demigods like there are, but there are some demigods like uh, Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, and Parvati Devi. I think they 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 consider to be a different class where they are really Vaishnavas. So how do we differentiate that which demigods are actually um, more realized souls and those who are not up to that level yet? How can we differentiate them? Well, we have oh, here. Yeah. We have. We have to hear about them. Just like we hear Lord Shiva and his wonderful activities. How Lord Shiva drank the ocean of poison. How Lord Shiva performs different activities. Sometimes he's killing demons. Lord Shiva is a very exalted Vaishnava. He's always trying to, he tries to deliver people from the mode of ignorance. And he gives mercy to those people who are in the, the mode of ignorance and who are uh, ghosts and hobgoblins and so on. He goes to the crematorium and he tries to deliver these kind of people. In the Holy Dham, uh, it said, if, if you leave the body at Hari Harshitra, Lord Shiva will come there and chant the holy name of Lord Goranga in your ear. So that is the Vaishnava. That is Lord Shiva. He is Paradukha Dukhi. He is very unhappy to see the suffering of others. And he does his best to try to deliver them. You understand? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, there's another question, Maharaj. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Maharaj. If I'm not mistaken, in this material universe, as well, we have a Vaikuntha within this universe, right? Mm -hmm. um, and where, where Dhruva Loka is, that's where the Vaikuntha is, right, Maharaj? Am I right? Vaikuntha? Where Dhruva Loka is? Is that the Vaikuntha in this material universe? Vaikuntha in this material universe? Is there a Vaikuntha in this material universe? Yes, Maharaj. Well, uh, there's, there is, for example, we do have Dhruvaloka. Dhruvaloka is a spiritual planet which is within the material universe. Because I'm not sure, I, I remember, um, I think I read, read somewhere where they said that there are devotees that go back to, they don't go back fully to Vaikuntha Loka in the spiritual world, but they, they end up in the Vaikuntha Loka in the material universe. Is that something or is it wrong? I don't know where you heard it. Uh... I still can't remember. 
like how Drew, Drew Maharaj also uh, went back to to Drua Loka as well. And then there's some, it's something about when the material universe, they actually, uh, where all the souls go back to Garbhodakasai Vishnu, but the, the, the souls that are in Vaikuntha Loka, in Drua Loka, they go back to the spiritual sky, something like that. I think I read something like that. So I want to see if I'm right or am I misunderstanding it? Well, I don't know. I've never heard quite like this before. I don't quite know where you're quoting from, where, where this reference comes from. But usually, the general case, the general case is that a devotee will go back to Godhead. He'll enter into the spiritual planets, into one of the Vaikuntha planets, or even into Goloka. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Now, if, if one is not qualified to enter into the spiritual planet, then usually they will enter into the body of Mahavishnu and they'll wait there until the next creation takes place and they'll take birth again in the material world. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Okay. Any other point, points or questions? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question. Maharaj, uh, just now uh, in in the purport of Srila Prabhupada, they said that uh, they ignore, Prabhupada mentioned that they ignore the Vedic injunction, uh, Acharya Pasana, one, uh, must worship, one must worship Acharyas. Uh, generally, Maharaj, in uh, times like this, in Kali Yuga especially, there are so many, uh, uh, there are so many, uh, worshippers with so many directions, you know, with uh, so many beliefs. So, uh, like uh, recently during one of our preaching session, we had one of them asked uh, us that um, there are so many kinds of things, uh, so many beliefs and all, but why specifically we have to follow to the disciplic succession? Like as devotees, we know that, you know, through a guru, we are supposed, uh, through a guru, we can reach to Krishna. And uh, there was this, um, I, I'm not so sure uh, uh, when this person told me, even I'm not so sure, they say that uh, it is as good as uh, if we are going to worship Jesus Christ, we are going through Mother Mary. To me, it didn't make a lot of sense. So in this kind of uh, situation, Maharaj, uh, how are we supposed to uh, answer and how are we supposed to tackle a situation like this? Like they ask, why are we supposed to go through a guru when we can directly approach the Lord. Like in normal temples, we go directly and we just worship. But why are we supposed to accept a Guru in order for us to approach the Lord? Well, you cannot easily approach the Lord. It's not so easy thing to directly go to the Lord. You want to go and see the Lord without any introduction. Even in the material world, we give the example, you want to go and see someone who is the head of the country. He may be the prime minister or something. You want to go and see him. Is, it, is he likely to meet you? You may say, no, you know, I'm coming from you. I'm, I'm, I'm a citizen of your country. I want to see you. I want to meet you. No, <laughs> we, we don't get access to these people. And similarly, the Lord is restrictive about meeting people if somebody comes there without an introduction. If you want to go to the Lord directly, nobody's introducing you. What is your qualification? What right have you got to go there and meet the Lord? You have no, we have no qualification. But if we are introduced, if we are introduced, by the Lord's devotee. Then, by the grace of the Lord's devotee, we can meet the Lord. But to go directly to the Lord, without any introduction from anyone, the Lord doesn't appreciate that. In fact, he's, the Lord himself has described to Uddhava. He said, one who says he is my devotee, is not my devotee. But if he's a devotee of my devotee, then he is my devotee. So this is the words of the Lord himself. 
The Lord himself declares this process. You have to go through a devotee. You don't go to him directly. You understand? Yes, Maharaj. It's very clear now. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Okay. Any other question or comments? If you're attracted to the material world, then that desire to enjoy the material world is stopping you from developing transcendental knowledge. In order to cultivate transcendental knowledge, you have to have detachment from the material existence. The more you're attached to enjoying the material world, then the less you can understand transcendental knowledge. Because your mind is absorbed in the thought of enjoying the material world. So you have no qualification to understand transcendental knowledge. You want to understand transcendental knowledge? You have to let go of the material. Well, the personal concept of the absolute truth is revealed to the devotees by the acharyas because the devotees submissively sent, surrender to the acharyas and they hear from the acharyas. So they're properly guided to understand everything in its right manner. But if you, go, if you don't go through the acharyas, if we, don't, if we neglect the process, and then we simply create confusion for ourselves. And we simply understand everything in the wrong way. We become, we speculate, we try to understand by the power of our own imperfect senses, our limited mind and senses. And we can never understand in that way. Okay. Yes. Mm. Right. Okay, we're going to go ahead to mantra 13. Anya Debahu Sambabad, Anya Dahura Sambabad, it is a Srumatiranam, Yenas Tadvichaksakshare. It is said that one result is obtained by worshipping the supreme cause of all causes, and that another result is obtained by worshipping what is not supreme. All this is heard from the undisturbed authorities who clearly explained it. Purport. The system of hearing from undisturbed authorities is approved in this mantra. Unless one hears from a bona fide acharya, 
who is never disturbed by the changes of the material world. One cannot have the real key to transcendental knowledge. The bona fide spiritual master who has also heard the Shruti mantras or Vedic knowledge from his undisturbed Acharya never presents anything that is not mentioned in the Vedic literature. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly said that those who worship the Pitris or forefathers attain the planets of the forefathers. That the gross materialists who make plans to remain here stay in this world. And that the devotees of the Lord who worship none but Lord Krishna, the supreme cause of all causes, reach him in his spirit in his spiritual sky. Here also in Sri Upanishad, it is verified that one achieves different results by different modes of worship. If we worship the Supreme Lord, we will certainly reach him in his eternal abode. And if and if we worship demigods like the sun god or moon god, we can reach their respective planets without a doubt. And if we wish to remain on the wretched planet with our planning commissions and our stopgap political adjustments, we can certainly do that also. So, Srila Prabhupada is just reconfirming what he had already stated in the previous mantra. According to the Bhagavad Gita, the worshippers of the Pitris go to the planets of the Pitris. The worshippers of the, the Supreme Lord, they will go to the planet of the Supreme Lord. And if you worship the Devas, you go to the planet of the Devas. So you get the results of your worship. It's a common knowledge. In the Christian Bible, they say, as you sow, so shall you reap. So you get the results of your work. Everything is done by our own. It's our own doing. Nobody else is responsible. So we have to be careful how we work and who we work for. Srila Prabhupada's purport continues. Nowhere in authentic scriptures is it said that one will ultimately reach the same goal by doing anything or worshipping anyone. Such foolish theories are offered by self-made spiritual masters who have no connection with the parampara, the bona fide system of the cyclic succession. The bona fide spiritual master cannot say that all paths lead to the same goal and that anyone can attain this goal by his own mode of worship of the demigods or of the supreme or whatever. Any common man can very easily understand that a person can reach his destination only when he has purchased a ticket for that destination. A person who has purchased a ticket for Calcutta can reach Calcutta, but not Bombay. But the so-called spiritual masters say that any and all paths will take one to the supreme goal. Such mundane and compromising Offers attract many foolish creatures who become puffed up with their manufactured method of spiritual realization. The Vedic, in, the Vedic 
instructions, however, do not uphold them. Unless one has received knowledge from the bona fide spiritual master who is in the recognized line of the cyclic succession, one cannot have the real thing as it is. Krishna tells Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, Evam param param praptam imam raja seo vidu sakaleneha mahata yoga nashta parantapa. The supreme science was thus received through the chain of disciplic succession, and the saintly kings understood it in that way. But in course of time, these but in but in course of time the succession was broken and therefore the science as it is appears to be lost so we were just thinking like why do we have to have a spiritual master why it has to be disciplined succession but you have to understand these, these things are recommended by Lord Krishna. These things are recommended by Lord Sri Krishna. It's not that we're saying that Lord Krishna himself established the process of disciplic succession. And Lord Krishna himself established the process of approaching a spiritual master. And we see Lord Krishna, although he is the Supreme Lord, he also had a spiritual teacher. That after he had killed Kamsa, then Vasudeva and Devaki wanted that Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram should get education, and they sent them to the ashram of Sandipani Muni. So Sandipani Muni taught Krishna, Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram all the Vedic science. And they learned all the different arts, all six, 64 different arts, and it took 64 days. And so Lord Krishna learned everything perfectly. Every, every day, every time he was taught, he learned perfectly. He could master everything. Why, did he, why does Lord Krishna go to a spiritual teacher? He wants to set an example for all of us that we need to go to a spiritual teacher. We need a teacher. We need that guidance. And that teacher's qualification is that he's connected to the parampara. Because the parampara goes back to Lord Krishna. So by connecting to a spiritual teacher who is in parampara, then we are connected to Lord Krishna. And he is the, orig the original teacher. So I hope this point is clear. It's very important. We'll recall when Lord Sri Krishna was present on this earth, the, the Bhakti Yoga principles defined in the Bhagavad Gita had become distorted. Therefore, the Lord had to re establish the disciplic succession, beginning with Arjuna who was the most confidential friend and devotee of the Lord. The Lord clearly told Arjuna that it was because Arjuna was his devotee and friend that he could understand the principles of the Bhagavad Gita. In other words, only the Lord's devotee and can understand the Gita. This also means that only one who follows the path of Arjuna can understand the Bhagavad Gita. So again, Srila Prabhupada is making this important point to us that if we want to understand the Bhagavad Gita, we have to follow the path of Arjuna. Arjuna's path was to surrender to Lord Krishna. And we see that in the second chapter, Arjuna told Lord Krishna, Shishas, Shishas, Mamsadi, Mamra, Pramapadhanam, 
that now I'm your disciple and I will surrender unto you. Please instruct me. And then in the fourth chapter, text number three, where Krishna repeats Arjuna's qualification for hearing my Bhagavad Gita, the Lord told Arjuna, because you're my devotee as well as my friend, therefore you understand that is this transcendental science. So we should appreciate that there is a qualification necessary to understand this knowledge. Just like you want to go to university, you have to be qualified. There's entrance exams and so on. So there's also qualifications to understand the science of the Bhagavad Gita. And we have to be a devotee. We have to be uh, related to Lord Krishna. We have to be following this path of Arjuna. Taking shelter of Lord Krishna. It means also taking shelter of Lord Krishna's representative, the spiritual teacher. Prabhupada continues, at the present moment there are many interpreters and translators of this sublime dialogue who prefer nothing for Lord Krishna or Arjuna. Such interpreters explain the verses of the Bhagavad Gita in their own way and postulate all sorts of rubbish in the name of the Gita. Such interpreters believe neither in Sri Krishna nor in his eternal abode. How then can they explain the Bhagavad Gita? So obviously, if they don't believe in Lord Sri Krishna or in his eternal abode, then certainly it will be very difficult for them to explain the Bhagavad Gita. We have to hear from devotees, devotees who cultivate knowledge carefully under the guidance of a devotee. And then only we can properly understand. The teaching in the purple Krishna clearly says that only those who have lost their, their sense worship the demigods for paltry rewards. Ultimately, he advises that one give up all other ways and modes of worship and fully surrender unto him alone. Only those who are cleansed of all sinful reactions can, can have such unflinching faith in the Supreme Lord. Others will continue hovering on the mental platform with, with their paltry ways of worship, and thus will be misled from the real path under the false impression that all paths lead to the same goal. So, so Srila Prabhupada uh, had, had to meet this kind of philosophy from people many times. Of course, Srila Prabhupada was uh, living in Bengal, his home was in Calcutta, and this kind of philosophy, this, this is foolish statement that, that all paths lead to the same goal became actually common there in, in Calcutta in Bengal Bengali people that there was one Bengali man who propagated this kind of statement that, that all paths lead to the same goal and it's, it's just not true it's just not that all paths lead to the same goal. We can get that there's no self what do you do. You do, do things in one way, you get that. You do things in a different way, you get a different result. In Chinese, we would say, uh, if you plant melons, you will harvest melons. And if you plant beans, then you will harvest beans. 
are, are as the trees by the Bible says, as you sow, so shall you reap. You get the results of your work. So, so it's, it's just it's not true that all paths lead to the same goal. It's not, not at all a fact. And we should, should understand that point very clearly. And we should, should also preach against it. Because where is the logic behind this kind of the argument? There's, there's no logic. Prabhupada continues. In, in this mantra of Sri Shambhu Upanishad, the word Sambhavat, by, by worship of, of the Supreme Cause, is, is very significant. Lord Krishna is the original personality of Godhead, and everything that exists has, has emanated from him. In, in the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Lord says, Aam Sarvasya Prabhu Madhasarvam Bhavate Iti Madhavadam Mamam Buddha Bhava Samadhata I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The ones who practically know this engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. So, it's a short, short paragraph. The, the, the point is that the worship of Lord, Lord Krishna it is the ultimate worship. And, and Lord, Lord Krishna is worshiped because he is the source of everything. Everything comes from him. And this is stated by him also in the Bhagavad Gita. Getting in for the Lord. Here is a description of, of the Supreme Lord, given by the Lord himself. The words Sabashishirabhava indicate that Lord Krishna is, is the creator of everyone, including Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And then because these three principal deities of the material world, are created by the Lord. The Lord is the creator of, of all that exists in the material and spiritual worlds. Yes, yes it is an important point to understand that, that Lord Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, they, they are the gods of the material world and God of the deities of the material world. All created by the Supreme Lord, Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is the, the source of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. They all, they all come, come from him. Prabhupada continues, and then they cannot have the Gopalabhata Nani Vaishnishad. It is similar to said. He who existed before the creation of Brahma and who enlightened Brahma with Vedic knowledge is Lord Sri Krishna. Similarly, the Narayana Panisha states that then the Supreme Person Narayana desired to create all living beings. That thus from Narayana, Brahma was born. Narayan created all the Chachapatis. Narayan created Indra. Narayan created the eight Vasus. Narayan created the eleven Rudras. Narayan created the Pradipiyas. Since Narayan is the preliminary manifestation of Lord Krishna, Narayan and Krishna are one and the same. The, the Narayana Anandashiva also states the Deity Son Krishna is the Supreme Lord. The identity of Narayana with, with the Supreme Cause has also been accepted and confirmed by, by Sri Pachacharya. Even though Shankara does, does not belong to the Vaishnava Baba or part of this cult. The Akarva Veda Mahapanjara also states only Narayana existed in the beginning 
with but neither Brahma, nor Shiva, nor, nor fire, nor, nor water, nor, nor stars, nor, nor sun, nor, nor moon existing. The Lord, Lord does not, not remain alone, but, but creates as he desires. The Krishna is now taking the Moksha Dharma. I created the Rajapati and the Rudras. They, they do not have complete knowledge of me because they are covered by my illusory energy. It is all stated in the Varaha Purana. Narayana is the supreme personality of God. And from him, the four-headed Brahma has manifested it, as well as Rudra, who later became omnipotent. So, so in this way, Sri Prabhupada is establishing the position of the Supreme Position of the Lord Sri Krishna and how the great great temples are like, like Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are under the Lord, under the supremacy of the Supreme Lord Krishna. It is the Lord Krishna who is the original Supreme Personality of the God. So, what are the different statements we give? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I
find myself trying to be for what is I'm having with society and community. So just Arjuna wanted to come out of the land of the non-violent and the world. But when he became Buddha by creating the knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita from the Supreme Person, he changed his decision. And they gave a worshipper of the Lord Krishna, who had himself arranged the battle of Kurukshetra. Arjuna worshipped the Lord by fighting with his so called relatives, and in this way he became a pure devotee of the Lord. Such accomplishments are possible only when one worships the real Krishna and not some. Fabricating Krishna in the identity by foolish men who are the knowledge of the intricacies of the science of Krishna, the scribes in Bhagavad Gita and Ashimad Bhagavad Gita. So here we are in Bhagavad Gita. We are getting the examples of the Lord Arjuna. With such a dear disciple and devotee of your Lord Krishna. So the Lord can convince and I'm going to give up on bodily conception of my life and to engage in the transcendental love of the service. Arjuna worship the Lord by fighting with the so called allies. So Arjuna worship such a very special. But his fighting with his relatives was how we worship the Lord. The filial desire of the Lord by fighting a king in the battle. So, so this is very Arjuna. This is remembered the hero of the Kurukshetra war. Because this is an end of the desire of Lord Rosh Hashanah. To do what Rosh Hashanah wanted. Krishna's sister is Arjuna. Uh, uh, have you understood the thing? In the process, Arjuna was just going to explain the Bible of the Gaitanian to Arjuna. It was not beyond the Arjuna. If he had it again, the Lord was ready to speak it again. So that is the time I said to the Lord. We will continue to talk about it. A god in the land of the Sutra, some of the Buddha is a social sword and a sentence, as well as the bread of the remains after annihilation. Jamja Jaja Jaja Jaja, the Sutra Mahavadita, the natural commentary of the Buddha Sutra, by the same author, maintains that the source of all emanations. It is not, not like, like a, a dead end stone, but, but it is, is a big or fully conscious. The primeval Lord Krishna now always says in the Bhagavad Gita that he is fully conscious of past, present, and future, and that then no one, including the demigod, such as Shiva and Brahma, knows him fully. Certain have an educated spiritual leaders who are served by the ties of a material existence can not know him fully. They try to make some compromise by making the mass of humanity the place the object of worship. But they do not know that the best of worship is only a myth. Because, because the masses are imperfect, they are attempt by the so-called spiritual leaders is something they like like or 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 on the leaves of a tree instead of the rivers. The natural process is the total water from the rivers, but by that much the discernment leaders are more or less the leaves than the rivers. This is why they are perpetually watering the leaves. However, 
We don't just only think about people, we think also about the animals and all living entities which try to benefit them. So how to benefit them? By giving the Krishna consciousness, by giving the Prasada, by chanting the holy name. Right. continues. The living being is perpetually suffering in different types of bodies. Hare Krishna, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, you can hear me all right. Good. Now, the living being is perpetually suffering in different types of bodies from the material miseries of birth, old age, disease, and death. The human form of life offers one a chance to get out of this entanglement simply by, by re establishing the lost relationship between the living entity and the Supreme Lord. The Lord comes personally to teach this philosophy of surrender unto the Supreme. The Sambhutta, real service to humanity, is rendered when one teaches surrender to and worship of the Supreme Lord with full love and energy. That is the instruction of Sri Shishpanishad in this mantra. So we should not just point that the real service to humanity is when we teach surrender to and worship of the Supreme Lord with full love and energy. That is the greatest gift we can give to humanity. And the Lord personally comes to teach us these things. The simple way of worship, the simple way to worship the Supreme Lord in this age of disturbance is to hear and chant about his great activities. The mental speculators, however, think that the activities of the Lord are imaginary. Therefore, they refrain from hearing of them and invent some word jugglery without any substance to divert the attention of the innocent masses of people. Instead of hearing of the activities of Lord Krishna, such pseudo-spiritual masters advertise themselves by inducing their followers to think about them. In modern times, the number of such pretenders has increased considerably and it has become a problem for the pure devotees of the Lord to save the masses of people from the unholy propaganda of these pretenders and pseudo-incarnations. So, Srila Prabhupada is Impressing, impressing on us the danger of these bogus philosophies and how we have to try to protect people and save them from these things by our own spiritual propaganda, by our own work in distributing Lord Chaitanya's message, then we can give the greatest benefit to the people. But if they hear all this nonsense, the glorification of the pseudo-teachers, then it's very harmful for people. The Upanishads indirectly draw our attention to the primeval Lord, Sri Krishna. 
But the Bhagavad Gita, which is the summary of all the Upanishads, directly points to Sri Krishna. Therefore, one should hear about Krishna as he is by hearing from the Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam. And in this way, one's mind will gradually be cleansed of all contaminated things. Srimad Bhagavatam says that by hearing of the activities of the Lord, the devotee draws the attention of the Lord. Thus the Lord being situated in the heart of every living being helps the devotee by giving him proper direction. The Bhagavad Gita confirms this. The Dhamma Buddha Yoga Bhutan Yenamam Upayantite. To those who are constantly devoted to me and worship me with love, then I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So, Lord Krishna is very kind upon the devotee. And when he sees the sincere desire of the devotee, then certainly Krishna helps him. All right, we'll just finish this report here. The Lord's inner direction cleanses the devotee's heart of all contamination produced by the material modes of passion and ignorance. Non-devotees are under the sway of passion and ignorance. One who is in passion cannot become detached from material hankering, and one who is in ignorance cannot know what he is or what the Lord is. Thus, when one is in passion or ignorance, there is no chance for self-realization, however much one may play the part of a religionist. For a devotee, the modes of passion and ignorance are removed by the grace of the Lord. In this way, the devotee becomes situated in the quality of goodness, the sign of a perfect Brahmana. Anyone can qualify as a Brahmana if he follows the path of devotional service under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. Srimad Bhagavatam also says, Kirita Nanda Pulinda Pukisha Abira Shumba Yavna Kasha Daya Yadyesha Papa Yadapasha Yashraya Shujanti Tasmai Prabha Vishna Maha. Any low born person can be purified by the guidance of a pure devotee of the Lord. For the Lord is extraordinarily powerful. So Prabhupada's making this important point that we have to come out of the influence of the modes of passion and ignorance. We have to come up to the mode of goodness in order to come, become Krishna conscious. We cannot simply remain in passion and ignorance. We have to clean the heart. And that cleansing of the heart will remove the passion and ignorance. So then once we come up to the mode of goodness, then we can become a proper brahmana. We can become situated in the mode of goodness. And Prabhupada quotes this important verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, which is stated by Sutta Deva Goswami. And he's, he lists in this verse, he lists all different races of different sinful tribes, right? Kirita, Hanandra, Pulinda, Pukhya, they're all different races. 
which are described in, in the Vedic culture, and they're all sinful people. There's, it's mentioned, for example, uh, Kasha Desh. Kasha means the Chinese, and Kirita was the African. So we have about the Africans a few days ago, and there are many different races, and they have addictions to sinful activity, but they can all be delivered by the grace of the Lord. So that is an important point. By the grace of the pure devotee, everyone can be delivered. The pure devotees are more merciful than Krishna. So just one final paragraph. When one attains Brahminical qualifications, he becomes happy and enthusiastic to render devotional service to the Lord. Automatically, the science of God is unveiled before him. By knowing the science of God, one gradually becomes freed from material attachments, and one's doubtful mind becomes crystal clear by the grace of the Lord. One who attains the state of a liberated soul and can see the Lord in every step of life. This is the perfection of Sambhava, as described in this mantra of Sri Ishopanishad. So Prabhupada is describing what happens with Brahminical qualification. And Brahma Buddha, Prasan Atma, one who is Brahminical qualified, then he should know he's not the body. He will become naturally joyful, detached from the body. Bhagavad Gita says, Brahma Buddha Prasanatma Nasochati Nakanchi. He's happy and he doesn't hanker for, he doesn't want anything, doesn't lament about anything. So Prabhupada describes he is happy, he is enthusiastic to render service to the Lord. So enthusiasm, Rupa Goswami mentioned that, very important for progress, must be enthusiastic. And then automatically the science of God is revealed. One gradually becomes freed from material attachments. And one's doubtful mind becomes crystal clear by the grace of the Lord. One's doubtful mind, the doubtful mind that for the doubting soul, there is happiness, neither in this world nor in the next. We, we won't be happy here, we won't be happy there either. So we have to learn to control the mind, we have to get over all these attachments. We want to become uh, we want our mind to become clear by the grace of the Lord. And when the mind becomes nice and clear, then we will become cool. We will be we'll give up that passion and ignorance. And we'll come to the liberated platform. And on that liberated platform, one can actually see the Lord. So this is described in this mantra, how the devotee can actually see the Lord. Are there any questions? Anybody has any question? Well, 
there is worship of demigods. It can be done in an in authorized manner. In other words, you worship, you recognize that demigods represent a particular limb of the body of the Lord. So when you worship the demigod, you consider that this demigod is a part of, is, is actually the limb, just like the sun is like the eye of the Lord. So you can worship the sun god as being the eye of the Lord. And you can worship him in that way. And, and then other different demigods, they're all related to different limbs of the body of the Lord. So we can worship the demigods if we understand they're not supreme, but they're just simply a part of the body of the Supreme Lord. And whatever whatever result we may get from the worship of the demigods, it has to be approved by the sanction of the Supreme Lord.